every arena of your life, you will meet opposition to the man of Jesus Christ. Every arena. In the household, you're going to meet it at work. Uh, you're going to meet it from your neighbor. You're going to meet it uh, in, in the store just trying to buy some groceries. Uh, you're going to meet opposition to Jesus Christ. Um, see, in, in the workplace, you can't talk about religion or politics, right? But they're going to force their religion and politics of political correctness on you. That's a religion. That's right. Amen. And, uh, and they're going to force that on you without your permission. They're not going to ask you if, if it offends you. Um, and uh, people get reprimanded in the workplace if their individuality includes Jesus Christ. Isn't political correctness all about individuality? I mean, it's about freedom to be who you want to be. But they're hypocrites. That's right. And uh, if, you're in, if your freedom of expression includes prayer and the Bible, then you're out of line, aren't you? So yeah. it seems to be politically correct. You have to be biblically incorrect. Amen. So once again, Jesus Christ leads us to the fork in the road, doesn't he? Always. He's not going to let you sit in the middle. Right. You're either for me or against me, Jesus says. Mm -hmm. So we're told in the Bible, turn over to 1 Peter 2.8. 1 Peter 2.8. In 1 Peter 2.8, talking about Jesus here. It says, in a stone of stumbling, in a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they are appointed. Jesus Christ will always be a stumbling stone to some God rejecter. Amen. Amen. Or some person playing church. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So um, Jesus is always going to be an offense to the world. Yeah. And don't be confused when he is. Don't be confused. <laughs> You know, sometimes we walk into, into a family situation, even on a holiday, and you're like, I don't get why everyone's treating me so weird. Because I came late because I didn't want to miss church. Right. Amen. Amen. Yes. At least I showed up, man. Come on. I mean, you know, if I really wanted to make a point, I wouldn't come. Yeah. Maybe you guys shouldn't be meeting on Sunday. <laughs> but whatever, you know. But uh, look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 18. What does the world consider foolishness? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. Thank you. You know, some people, they're, they're just not going to realize... <laughs> Why you see fit to stand on that street corner and shout at the top of your lungs, or if you can't shout that loud, you get a megaphone. I mean, they just can't understand why you would do that for such foolishness. Is Jesus Christ, God incarnate, dying on, a, on an old rugged cross for your filthy, wicked sin? Yeah. You know, for you, you being Lord. saved and born again and forgiven and sanctified and sealed? Thank you, you know, Lord. and for all sin that you had that would have damned you straight to hell. Amen. It's all washed away. Yeah, they you, can't Lord. understand why you would shout a little bit Lord. for about an hour or two. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That's right. That's, right. That's good preaching, brother. Amen. But don't Amen. forget the extreme weight in believing Jesus Christ is God. That's what we're talking about, the deity of Jesus. There's an extreme weight that comes with you endorsing that fact. When we're sharing with the lost and done world what the Savior's done and people get defensive, it's for a reason. Yeah. Some of those people, without you even bringing it up, you're saying that their family went to hell when they yeah. died. Yeah, that's right. They're going to have to admit that. Yeah. If Jesus was who He said He was. Amen. There's a little more at stake, amen, than taking a little 30-second prayer, amen? Because sometimes that's how we view it. It's like, why can't you just... You know what? Look at everything he did. Why can't you just love it? Because there's a lot more at stake than that. Amen. Amen. It, it's, it's them having to admit, everything I've been taught since an infant has been wrong. Amen. My teachers, Amen. the priests I, I, I was raised up under. You know, all these people lied to me. That's Amen. what they would have to admit. There's some weight that goes along with realizing 
that the deity of Jesus Christ is a fact. Amen. With admitting. Because sometimes, watch out, brother. Come on. Come on. If you sit in the back or something. You know, you're in the front. So you're on video. You know what I'm saying? So just mellow out, right? But um, there's an extreme way. So if someone was to admit that Jesus was who he said he was, that's what they'd have to uh, what they'd have to deal with. And they're not willing to consider that Jesus is God for that reason. Amen. They're not willing to admit Jesus is God. It's a choice. It has nothing to do with rationale, nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with anything other than, you know what? I'm just choosing not to believe it. There you go. There it is. That's it. Because if they did endorse it, everything about them would have to change. They would have to humble themselves, and they'd rather take their chances hoping that Jesus is not deity. And that's all it is. It's just rolling the dice. Yep. And the odds aren't good. No. Already been laid out. So when we're discussing the rationale and the simple, basic way to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, don't be fooled. There's much more at stake. You're dealing with a lot more than what you see. For that five seconds, you may see this individual. Amen. That's right. Much more at stake than where they're going to spend an hour a week. That's how we view it sometimes. It's just like, look, they're going to, instead of spending an hour there a week, they spend an hour here a week. Much more at stake. So the first thing I want to look at is they say Christ can't be God because he was a human. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, God, for your sweet spirit in here. Just we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this place. And God, we, we just pray for just a few moments that we can give you our mind's eye, give you our attention, Lord, and that, that we would uh, try to learn something today, God, that we could use with our family, use with our neighbors, use with those maybe we'll meet at the track table in a little while. And uh, just pray, Lord, that you would just guide this whole thing, that the Holy Spirit would meet us in strength and power and give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So they say Christ can't be God because he was a, a human, a mere man, saying that he was man. Uh, they're saying that he had flesh and bones, a beginning, and he was created. See, at first glance, you might say, you're right. Sure enough, he was a man. But if you side with that completely, you reject the dual nature of Jesus Christ. That's right. The dual nature of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was a man, but he was also God. He proved this by his miracles. He proved this by his sinlessness. And don't forget the little thing he resurrected from the dead. Amen. Amen. It's a very little thing. Yeah. yeah. Some people just seem to jump over that. Yeah. See, the Jews, the Muslims, the JWs, the Mormons, while they disagree on everything else, they will agree on this one point. They're going to say that Jesus Christ was only a man. That's right. And they'll go to hell believing that. That's right. Look over at Numbers 23, 19. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. Chapter 23 and verse 19. They'll even use your Bible to tell you that God's not a man. Numbers 23, verse 19. Why, there it is. God is not a man. Look over at Job chapter 9 and verse 32. Job chapter 9 and verse 32. For he, God, is what? Not a man. For he is not a man. So, do we just stop there? No. Do we just say, you know what, there's two verses. I might as well go home. You know what, maybe Jesus was a liar. You know, if Jesus was a liar, you have no hope. Amen. Where are you going to go? Amen. Amen. See, in the Bible... I'm sorry, the Bible in the wrong hands can be, and I'm using this word, handled to say virtually anything. That's right. That's right. A JW at your doorstep will use your Bible to show you some things. Yeah. Um, the guy that drank the purple Kool-Aid, you know what kind of Bible he used? King James Bible. 
Um, anybody can use a Bible yeah. and make it say whatever they want. But never forget, even the devil uses the Bible. Yes, he does. Right. He got in there in Genesis chapter 3 and he says, Yea, if God said, he starts twisting the words of God. Shall you not eat every tree of the garden? Twisting it up. Yeah. Purging it out. I mean, changing it. Yeah. You know, putting that seed of doubt in the Word of God. Right. You know, and sure enough, that devil was bold enough. He met your Lord and Savior in the wilderness after he was baptized. After, after God said, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus went out there into the wilderness led by the Spirit. Yeah. See, T.D. Jakes doesn't want to talk about that. Yeah. doesn't want to talk about a wilderness experience led by the Spirit right. into it. If you're walking with the Lord, you might walk straight into a wilderness. That's right. That's right. But you're not going to get that character. You're not going to get the shaping. You're not going to get the strength that you need if you avoid that wilderness. Amen. 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 But that devil got in there and he started using, using the Word of God against the author, yeah, against the Creator, against the living Word of God. Yeah. And you know what? Jesus didn't roll up his sleeves and start fighting him with, with hands and fists. He just started shooting that scripture right back. That's right. Shall worship the Lord. Worship your God. Amen. You know, and uh, worship thy God. Amen. So, look over in 2 Corinthians. If you're still in 1 Corinthians, hang a right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Anybody can use the Word of God. But the Bible says they handle it. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, let's look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Verse 2. Am I in the right verse? Yeah. But, I, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling, handling, handling the Word of God deceitfully. Yes. They're handling something. They're handling the Word of God deceit, deceitfully. Yeah. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He says, look, we're not like that. We're not coming around handling the Word of God deceitfully. That's good. You know, Joel Osteen can take one verse and then spend the rest of the time talking about his view of things, talking about what psychology says, yes. and he's not going to help any of the millions of people that are looking to him for the Word of God. And Okay. God, <laughs> let me slow it down a little bit. If the man's saved, I don't know his heart. If the man's saved, he's sure going to have to give account for a lot. Yeah. But if he ain't, he's going to burn in a deep, dark, fiery pit. And he's going to have a deep place. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> See, the Bible says that we're supposed to rightly divide the Word of Truth. We don't handle the Word of God. Right. We don't say, look, you're going to say this here. You're going to say this here. Right. We were talking about it yesterday, weren't we, brother? We we're, were talking about you come on bended knee and you say, speak for that servant here. Yes. What do you want to tell me today, Lord? Yes. I want to hear you. Give me something to get me through tomorrow. Give me something to get, get me through the week. Yes, yeah. Lord. I need something to live off of. Here for you, Lord. I'll read this. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Right. See, you know, I think a lot of Christians... They forget that the Bible tells you there's many that corrupt the Word of God. Right. You start talking to Christians about the Laodicean church age we're in, and they say, I don't see a thing wrong. My church is just doing great. We're just doing fine. Why? You know, we had a fellow yesterday say, you know, I go to a church that runs 5,000. If you're looking for numbers, you're in the wrong church. Yeah, man. If you're looking for numbers, you might as well just go to the Catholic Church. There you go. If you want to go for numbers, man, they, got they got the numbers. Woo. You know, but somewhere along the line, God showed that, man. That's wrong. Yeah. He got out of there. But what's he default to again? Looking for numbers. Don't forget, man, what God has shown you. Right. 